thank you very much for inviting me to speak and welcome to all the Spanish speaking community. I'm going to be talking about precision medicine and specifically a gene called UNC13A and how that might affect clinical trials. This is a graph showing the result of genetic testing in nearly 30,000 people with ALS and more than 122,000 people who don't have ALS. And what we've done is we've compared about 7 million genetic variants in each person. We've compared for each group, is there a difference in how common that particular gene variant is? And then the more different the two groups are, the bigger the red line you can see. So all these red lines are showing genetic variants that are more frequent in people with ALS than people who don't have ALS. So you can think of them as risk factors for ALS. So for example, this very big variant right in the middle that looks a little bit like a skyscraper. By the way, this is called a Manhattan plot because it looks like the skyline of Manhattan. So this very large um, signal in the middle, that comes from a gene called C9RF72, which in the UK at least affects about 10% of people who have ALS. So it's quite an important cause of ALS. I've highlighted that because that increases risk, but actually all of these variants do. I've also highlighted another one on the right-hand side, which you can see is called UNC13A. And by the way, you don't need to care about these funny little numbers, RS, those are those digits there, those are just a code for geneticists to know exactly which variant this is referring to. But the important thing is these two variants particularly are important. Um, the reason they're important is they don't just impact risk, but they also change survival. So C9 or F72, if you carry that variant, you're more likely to have rapid disease. And the same is true if you carry UNC13A. If you carry the genetic variants in that gene that increase your risk of ALS, they also make your ALS more aggressive. So it's quite important to know, does somebody carry those variants or not, if they have aggressive disease, if we can make a treatment that can specifically slow that or can tackle those particular genetic variants. So you can see that here on a graph again. This graph on the left, the y-axis, shows the proportion of people alive at any point. And on the x-axis along the bottom, it shows the number of months. So you can see that at the beginning of the study, everybody is alive. And then as time goes on, the line drops down. So that tells you that people are dying as the study is going on. Now, because of the way the graph is designed, the more horizontal the line or the more to the right the line is, the better the survival. And the more vertical or the more to the left the line is, the worse the survival. And what you can see, the blue line, the topmost line, is people who don't carry either of these two genetic variations that I explained, C9 or F72 or UNC13A. They don't carry those. They have better survival. Whereas the people who do carry those gene variations, their lines are much lower, and that tells us that they have worse survival. So for example, at the end of one year, there are about 90% of people still alive who don't carry those variations, whereas about 30% of people who carry those variations have died. So only about 70% are left. So they're very aggressive gene variants. Now, UNC13A is important for the release of neurotransmitters. These are signals that go between nerves that are used for communication. And specifically, they are found, it's found important in a particular type of connection called an excitatory synapse. Now that's a connection between two nerves where one nerve tells the next nerve to switch on because one nerve can also tell the next nerve to switch off, which is called an inhibitory synapse. But the ones that communicate to switch on the next nerve are very common in the motor system. So the fact this is found as, a, as a helping the motor system move, because it helps the excitatory synapse work, the fact that it's helping those and it's important for that release tells us why if you have damage to that gene, that means the protein won't work properly, and that means those genes won't signal to each other properly. That system won't work properly. You won't be able to switch on the next gene, and that particularly is important for motor neurons. Now, we don't know exactly how the genetic variation in the UNC13A gene increases the risk of ALS, but it seems that it has 
particular part of the gene that's hidden normally. The body just ignores it. And there is another protein called TDP43, which is important in ALS. In people with ALS, that protein, TDP43, doesn't work properly. It doesn't sit in the right part of the cell. And when that happens, for some reason, this hidden part of UNC13A is revealed, and the UNC13A doesn't work properly either. So we think that somehow these two um, parts of the cell aren't working properly. The TDP43, which is part of the problem with ALS, somehow affects the UNC13A gene and makes it not work properly. If you carry two copies of this particular gene variation, then you will have the aggressive disease. So about 14%, so roughly one in seven people will carry these two copies. So if you are just a member of the general population and you carry these two gene vari this variation, you carry two copies, that increases your risk of ALS. It doesn't mean you will get ALS, but it makes it slightly more likely you will. But if you have ALS and you happen to be one of those people, then your ALS will be more aggressive. Now, many years ago, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a study that suggested lithium might be a good treatment for people with ALS. Many people did clinical trials of lithium in ALS, and none of them showed that it was beneficial. What I've got here is the combined results of three of those trials. And you can see the blue line and the red line, which represent people with lithium and people not taking lithium, they're almost identical. So that tells you that lithium really has no effect on ALS. Now, if you look at this graph, this is the same information from that previous graph. But what we've done here is we've pulled out the people who carry the UNC13A variation. And you can see that if those people were given the placebo, they were given the dummy tablet in the drug in the study, then their survival is, as previously, very bad. So about half of them are dead at one year. But the people who are given lithium who carry that genetic variant, they have a survival much more like everybody else. So it changes the disease from being very aggressive to a more normal rate of progression. It's not a cure by any means, but it would mean that somebody who instead of having aggressive disease will now have a more, um, a slower form of disease, a more typical pattern of ALS, then it's worth considering because lithium is very easy to find as a treatment. It's a cheap treatment and it's relatively easy for doctors to use. It's a very well-known treatment. So to explore that further, because this type of result isn't enough as strong evidence because it may just be a fluke, we've done another study, which is called the MAGNET study, and that's just started. This is a phase three clinical trial, which means it's the most important type of evidence we can get for whether a treatment will work or not. And it's an international study. Um, the main centers doing it at the moment are all in Europe and uh, include the UK. So the trial design is that we use what's called two to one randomization. That means you're twice as likely to get the active lithium as you are to get the fake, the placebo lithium. The treatment itself is 400 milligram capsules of lithium. And we start people on one capsule a day, and then we measure the lithium in the blood and we're aiming for a particular blood level. So we may need to increase or decrease the amount of lithium we're giving. Now, because that may, if, if you're adjusting the dose of lithium, that will tell people if they're on the drug or not, because we don't want to unblind the study. We don't want people to know whether they're on the active drug or not, because the whole point of clinical trials is that nobody knows until the end of the study whether they're taking the active or the placebo. So we will also be making what are called sham adjustments. So even people who are on the placebo will be asked to adjust whether they're taking one, two or three tablets. And that will be done by people who are outside the study, by independent observers. So as an investigator in this study, I will be asked to change the dose of my patient from one tablet to two tablets, for example, perhaps. But I wouldn't know if they're taking the real drug or the dummy drug. The study will go on for two years. And then at the end of that two years for each person, they will be given active lithium, regardless of which arm of the study they were in before. During the study, they will visit the center every three months for safety reasons, to have blood checked, and also just to monitor progress. 
The primary endpoint of the study is survival. That means we'll look at the end of the two years to see have more people um, died than expected in each arm. And what you can see on the right here is a survival prediction curve. Most clinical trials have a checklist to see if somebody will be eligible. So for example, the checklist will be something like, you must have ALS for less than two years. You must be aged less than 70. Your breathing must be better than 70%, etc. So there'll be a list of factors. And if you fail on any one of those, you're out of the study. And traditionally, that means that only about 8% of people are ever eligible for clinical trials. More than 90% aren't eligible. And that's not a very satisfactory situation. So we've changed that in this study by using a thing called the NCAL survival prediction model. And that's what this graph represents. It uses 10 pieces of information that are available to the neurologist at the very first visit. And those 10 pieces of information can predict somebody's survival quite well. So what you can see here, the solid line in each case is the prediction of survival for that group of people. And the dotted line is how long that group of people actually survived. You can see they all match very, very well. The way the trial is designed is we will take the bottom four groups of people. We will be excluding the small group of people who have extremely slow disease. And the reason for that is people who have very, very slowly progressive disease don't change during the course of the trial, whether they're on the active treatment or the placebo. And so we can't tell if there's a difference. So we need people who change quite a lot. Now, usually we would also exclude people who progress very rapidly. But in this trial, because UNC13A causes aggressive disease, we can't exclude people who progress rapidly. So they will also be included. But using this technique, more than 80% of people we expect to be eligible for the study. So that's a much better chance of being able to take part. That's better for the person who's wondering about taking part. And it's better also for the neurologist because it means we'll be able to recruit into our trial more quickly and therefore come to an answer more quickly. So just in conclusion, genetics can help us group people for trials. So in this case, we're taking everybody who carries the UNC13A gene variation and inviting them to take part in the trial. And more targeted treatment might be the future of ALS. This is probably something we can do using other genetic variations that uh, might respond to specific treatments. It means that somebody, for example, carrying UNC13A might take a cocktail of treatments. They might carry, they might take Riluzol and lithium. And perhaps if there's some other treatment, uh, there's some immune therapies, for example, that are looking quite interesting, maybe they'll end up taking those as well. So that in the end, the treatment for ALS probably won't be a single magic tablet, but a combination of treatments, each of which slows the disease down a little bit in the same way as lithium looks like it slows aggressive disease to more normal disease, and then really all slows the disease a bit further, and then some other therapy will slow it further, so that hopefully we can actually significantly slow it or even stop it. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Neymar. That was excellent. It's always a good thing, I guess, when drugs that were already tested some years ago and, and didn't work are repurposed for specific populations, right? I think that yes. I, I take it as a positive thing. Lithium was tested for uh, general ALS uh, some, some years ago, and it looked promising at some point. Uh, there, there, I remember there, there was a lot of hype because uh, it's also, as you said, as you mentioned during the, your presentation, is a is a quite easy drug to 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 get in the in, in any pharmacy. But uh, but then, uh, of course, as we all know, it finally failed. Uh, if I if I if I recall uh, correctly, uh, mostly because of some safety issues. Um, but now uh, we have another lithium trial. And this in this time is for uh, this very specific uh, uh, subtype of ALS. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How how, how was the process of, of getting lithium back in the game? So, um, there were some safety issues in one of the trials, but in most of the trials, because lithium was very very closely monitored, because you're right, there is a safety issue. It can damage the kidneys, for example. 
so long as it's closely monitored and, and the right decisions are made, it's, it's safe. Um, most of the trials, so the reason lithium was um, unsuccessful was simply for the reason I showed you with that graph. There was no difference between people taking lithium and people not taking lithium. The way it's come back into the picture is because um, Michael Van Es, who is a colleague in the Netherlands, decided to ask himself, could it be the reason their study was negative was simply because more people taking lithium happened to have the UNC13A genes than the people on the placebo. So that even though the lithium was working, because they have more aggressive disease, it was canceling that out. Because when people are allocated to treatment or the dummy drug to placebo, it's randomly done. And it may have been that by chance, too many people with the aggressive disease were in the treatment arm compared to people in the uh, dummy, the, the placebo arm. So that's how he decided to check for UNC13A. But actually when he did that, that's when he saw this pattern that I showed you that people with UNC13A actually, they were equally distributed, but it seemed that it maybe slowed down the disease. So then he approached um, our group in the UK and he also approached Adriano Kyo in Italy because we both had also clinical trials where we also had genetic data with the same samples. So we were able to then combine our results together and then have a look. We did this with ethical approval, of course, but then have a look and see. And we, we were all able to show exactly the result I, I was um, displaying earlier, where the people with UNC13A had more aggressive disease, but if they were taking lithium, the disease slowed down to more typical rates. Perfect, clear. And you said that the, this phase three is going to last for about two years, right? So, um, when can we expect some kind of uh, preliminary or interim results? So the trial itself will last longer than two years. It's two years for each person in the study, but we have to recruit. One of the things we've discovered, normally for clinical trials, when we recruit, we just ask people if they're interested in the trial, and then they, if they are, then we put them through the consent process and screen them. Because this causes aggressive disease, if you wait too long, then the number of people who are carrying the gene variant is very few. So we have to ask people almost immediately they're diagnosed. So that's a slight change from how we normally do it. Usually we give people the diagnosis, we give them a little bit of time to come to terms with that diagnosis, and then at the next visit we approach clinical trials. Here we have to really ask them about clinical trials almost immediately. Um, there will be an analysis earlier than the time the study finishes. So roughly a year or two into the study, we'll do what's called a futility analysis. So that's a special study that the statisticians will look at. So we don't get to see that result, but that they will ask themselves, could this be an effective treatment? Or is it that there really is so little signal, we know it's definitely not going to work. And if we know at that point, it's definitely not going to work, the study will finish. Or if it shows that actually there is a strong signal enough to continue, then we will continue. Good, good. And this magnet trial, it, it, it's it's sponsored uh, among others uh, by Tricles, right? Uh, one of the major research organizations in Europe. Uh, it was thought at the beginning as a platform trial. Uh, so meaning that uh, it would start with one regimen, in, in this case, UNC13A, and then it could add other regimens uh, into the same platform, right? Which is uh, kind of a, a, a new design in, in, in ALS research uh, that came in the last years as the Healy platform in, in, in America and as also the MND Smart in, 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 in the UK. So uh, it, is that still part of the plan to add more regimens or is going to, for now, it's just going to be UNC13A? With lithium, the lithium trial. So the pro the protocol is written so that this can be, if we wish, a platform trial. So as you say, more arms can then be added. The advantage of a platform trial, it, it's also called um, a multi-stage trial with multi-arms. The advantage is that you have a shared placebo group so that the number of people on active treatment is, your, the chance of you being on an active treatment rather than the placebo is much higher. 
it also means that you don't have to continually bring new sites on or train them or go to ethics for new approvals for a new protocol because it's all the same protocol. You just make an amendment and the sites are already trained in the protocol because they're already doing the study. You're just adding a new arm in. So the advantage of a platform trial is that it's a much faster way of testing drugs. The disadvantage is that you're forced into just using that protocol. And it may be, for example, a commercial company might want to come along and use a slightly different protocol. And then that poses some challenges. The other issue is, for example, this is a tablet, but another drug might be an injection. And then it becomes more difficult. It's not impossible, but it just becomes more challenging to do it as a platform. Um, and the other problem with the platform is you do really want the answer quickly in a platform, but that means the study is short, which is good from the patient's point of view because it means they get a chance to be on another drug. But it's bad from the scientific point of view because sometimes it does take a long time to get a really certain answer. And if you end up with an answer that's not quite certain, as has happened recently with some drugs that have got conditional approval, then you still have to go forward with yet another study and it just delays proper approvals. So for those reasons, we're wondering whether we should keep this as a platform or continue as TriCal's studies, because people who are sites that are already doing TriCal studies already have the same training. Everybody's been through TriCal's training. They already have the same staff because we're already doing TriCal studies. And add, the only extra step that means is um, the ethical approval process, which is already a little bit long anyway, so it doesn't really make that much difference. So the flexibility of not having a platform may outweigh the advantages of having a platform, and that's a discussion we're still having. So at the moment, this is the only arm in this platform study, um, and we're not sure whether it will continue to be the only arm or whether we'll add more. Yes, we 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 had a, a, a conversation with uh, uh, Sabrina Paganoni about a month ago from 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 the Healy platform, uh, and 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 yes, she she said that of course platform trials look like something that we should all be following because it, it gives you the chance to try more drugs in less time, but she did mention she did address a couple of disadvantages which are related to. Uh, when you want to study very specific populations. Uh, and so it's not, apparently platform trials are a, are, a, are a very good thing for ALS research, but but it's not for everything or for everyone, right? That, that could be the conclusion. Yes, and I think that's really important because there are already two platform trials in existence, as you pointed out. There's the Healy platform and then there's the MND Smart platform. So it's not that there's a shortage of platform trials to find these drugs quickly, but having the flexibility of having other trial designs is actually useful. So there are, there are pros and cons to doing it. Sure, yes. Uh, so the ALS research landscape ha has really, really changed. I mean, it's been changing for, 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 for a while, but now it, the, the 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 landscape is, is completely different. We have uh, in in a matter of just just a cup just a, a few months, we had two new drugs approved in in North America. Um, so, which is a is, is a very positive thing. Uh, so now we have uh, three drugs approved for the general population. They're not available everywhere. I know that, uh, and and then we have a specific. Uh, a drug uh, approved for uh, uh, a subpopulation, the, the SOD1 population. Uh, nevertheless, the, there is still a difference between if you see North America and if you see Europe, right? Uh, we all know that the uh, EMA it, it tends to be, let's say, stricter with 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 procedures and 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 in order to to approve drugs. And there, I know there is a number of reasons for that that we're not going to discuss now. And I know that um, many uh, European uh, researchers are supportive of those reasons. There is a rationale behind that. But uh, leaving that aside, uh, is, I was wondering, uh, does that pose any kind of pressure to ALS physicians in, in Europe um, considering the fact that uh, there is only there's still only one drug fully approved in Europe, which is Rilusol, and and 
patients know that there are other drugs available in other countries, that, does it bring a little bit of pressure at, at the time of, of, of seeing patients? So I haven't experienced that pressure myself because our patients understand it's a conditional approval and we can offer clinical trials. But also, for example, the Amelix drug, Relivrio, which is the one that's had conditional approval, is one of the ones you're talking about. Um, that drug, for example, has two components, Tudka and sodium phenylbutyrate, or B-phenyl. And Tudka, can, the, firstly, there's a trial of Tudka in Europe anyway, um, but you can just obtain Tudka relatively simply um, over the counter. So people who are interested in that particular drug will just take Tudka themselves. And that doesn't, for most of our trials, prevent them also taking part in a clinical trial. So it doesn't really pose a strong pressure that we've experienced. And in fact, as you explained, lots of the neurologists in Europe are happy that we have a very stringent bar because it means that when we have something approved, we know it really does work because there are disadvantages to having something that you're not sure if it works and yet you're giving it to everybody because you may be giving them something with lots of side effects, but no benefit. And there's obviously an ethical issue in that. But, and of course, people will say, well, I have ALS, I'm dying anyway. I don't need, I, I don't care about those risks. But for example, if those risks are, it makes you blind or it gives you severe pain, then that's on top of your ALS. It's not, the risk isn't just that it might kill you. The risk is that it might cause disability or some other kind of problem. So it is important that we're safe. And um, having a certain answer is a very important thing to do. Clear, perfect. Uh, and and what 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 other things that are uh, that are happening in, in, in AS research around the world uh, uh, are, are are making you feel more enthusiastic? I mean, I, I guess a lot of things, but in terms of uh, not only drugs, but in terms of uh, trial design, in terms of biomarkers, can can you mention what, some of those? Yes, there are many. So, um, well, tofersin is a, is a drug that you were talking about earlier, which is a, a genetic therapy for SOD1, for people carrying the SOD1 gene variations. Now, that was important because the first response seen for people having that drug as an intervention was a change in their neurofilament level. And neurofilaments are part of the cell skeleton for, for the nerve cells, the neurons. What keeps them long and, and strong is neurofilaments. But when those cells die, those neurofilaments leak out and we can detect them with a test. What people in that trial showed is that if those neurofilament levels are high to start with, when they were given the genetic therapy, the neurofilament levels dropped after about three months. And about three months to six months after that, they had a clinical change, a clinical improvement. So that tells us lots of things. First, it tells us that having neurofilaments respond probably indicates that there will be a good response to the treatment clinically. It also tells us that it does take time for these drugs to work. This is a very targeted therapy, specifically attacking SOD1 gene mutation. So, so we know exactly how it's working. And even in that situation, it still took three months for there to be a chemical response and then six to nine months for there to be a clinical response. So if you've got a treatment that's perhaps less effective than that, but still very effective, there may not be a change in your neurofilaments and it may still take a year or two to detect that change clinically. So it tells us all of that. So that's that's one thing that's interesting, but it actually, what for me, what was striking about that is it's, it's essentially a very meaningful treatment, a proper treatment for ALS, even though it's only useful for 2% of people, it shows that it is possible to significantly slow down or stop ALS progression. That's really important to know. Another advance that's very important is um, our knowledge of um, the role of inflammation in ALS. So that's actually um, a shift that's happening across a lot of neurological diseases now that we're understanding inflammation is important in the brain. About 20, 30 years ago, so I started ALS research in 1994, my supervisors at the time told me that inflammation was nothing to do with ALS because you couldn't see any signals of inflammation. But actually now we've got more sophisticated techniques. We can see inflammation is very important. And following that up, um, Nigel Lee and Gilbert Ben-Simon, um, both of whom were involved in discovering Riluzol, in fact, 
did a trial that's just finished, which was called the Miracals trial, using an immune therapy, low-dose interleukin-2. And that immune therapy, the results were presented at the International Symposium in December. Um, the results from that showed that people who have, um, when you adjust for the neurofilament levels, people who have very, um, people who have slow disease or moderate disease, so about 80% of people, in other words, so not the 20% with very fast disease, but everybody else um, had a benefit from taking this low dose interleukin 2, that it slowed the disease down uh, by their results that they showed then, potentially up to about 50% reduction in death at two years. So that's quite a big effect. We don't know about the people with the faster progression because usually people in that situation drop out of clinical trials too fast for you to be able to get the information. So it may be that it also works in those people, but we can't answer that question. So that to me is also another very important advance. And I'm hoping to see the proper publication from that result soon. And uh, hopefully it'll be something that's another licensed drug for ALS. And then um, in the UK, we're very excited because we lobbied for uh, a, a national motor neuron disease research institute. We asked the government for 50 million pounds in a, a campaign, and that would be matched by charity funding and with industry partners. And that was successful. So the first parts of that have already launched and there's more coming. Um, so that's a very exciting thing because it networks the whole UK together. And I think it might be a good model for other countries to follow. I'm very happy to give people information on how we did that. And then clinical trial design, we've already discussed um, platform designs, but I think just we are getting better at knowing what is the target we should go for and how should we do it? How should we measure the outcomes? We're understanding the problems with things like the ALS functional rating scale and how to adjust for them. We're understanding the best way to, to really do the analysis. All of these clinical trial changes mean that we'll be more um, we'll be quicker at finding new drugs because we can just do the trials better. Wonderful. Uh, you will tell me how far you can go with the answer to this question, but uh, uh, can you can you tell us uh, what do you think that the, the current situation of oral Edarabone is in Europe in terms of potential approval? So oral Edarabone is... Um, is slightly complicated in Europe because intravenous adarabone hasn't been approved. Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma, the company that made intravenous adarabone, um, did a bioequivalence study. That means they did a study to see, can they make a tablet that produces the same level in the blood of adarabone as having it intravenously? And they showed that they can. So having that tablet means you don't, you no longer have to have an intravenous line. You can just take the tablet and you'll get the same level in your blood. Now, the European Medicines Agency didn't accept their clinical trial data as robust enough to approve in Europe. And you can argue about whether that was the right or the wrong decision. But what it means is we don't have a Darabone approved in Europe. So our only choice was to do a proper phase three study, which is what we're doing of daily oral Darabone. So that's what's happening now. Um, that study is called ADORE. And we'll know the results of that relatively soon, but that study is ongoing at the moment. Great, that was a good update, thank you. And I think probably, finally, uh, I mean, we, we, we've known you, we, we've known you, Amar, for, for, for a while, for, for some, some years already. Uh, and, and some years ago when we had, uh, a, when we used to have conversations, not, not only with you, but also with other experts uh, about gene testing. It was a very different conversation, like seven, eight, nine years ago uh, than, than it is now. Uh, it, it is starting to make more sense for not only for all patients, but also for even uh, family relatives, right, to, to go through gene testing. Because now with that information, it looks like you have something to do because if, if you don't have anything going on on the research side, then getting that piece of information uh, wasn't that useful. I mean, it, it was always useful, but there was nothing that you could really do. Now, we, have, we already have one drug that is approved in, in, in some countries for SOD1 
for SOD1, for the SOD1 gene, you just gave a presentation about the, the, the young 13A trial. So um, would you recommend everyone, and not only patients, but also uh, uh, family members to go through gene testing and for all kinds of genes or just for specific genes? It's so, kind of a two or three part question, I know. Yeah, it's a very important question. So if I just answer the first part, who should be tested? So I think everybody with ALS should be offered genetic testing, nearly everybody. Um, regardless of whether they have a family history of ALS or frontotemporal dementia or not. The reason is about 90% of people don't have a family history of ALS. And we know from studies that we and others have done that about 20% of those people will carry a genetic variation that is either known to be an ALS risk factor or is very likely to be an ALS risk factor. So it's worth doing the test to know if you carry one of those genetic variations, because if you have, or if you are, if you have a family member, or if you are somebody who is planning a family, then there is something you can do called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you can, you don't even have to know your own genetic status, but you can ensure that the next generation does not carry that gene variation. It also means you could potentially take part in a clinical trial if there is a clinical trial for that gene. So for SOD1, for example, there's a trial at the moment, uh, sorry, there's tofersin, which isn't in a trial, which is now available to you. But if you carry the C9 gene variation, there's a clinical trial for C9. For FUS, which is another gene, there's also a clinical trial for that. So there is, as you say, something you can do because not for everybody, but for many people, there'll be some action you can take, even if it's to enroll in a clinical trial, which is an important thing to be able to do. So the second question is, should we test people who are relatives of people with ALS, but who are unaffected themselves? So if you're a relative and you've only got one person in your family affected, so you have no other family history, then I would say you probably shouldn't be tested. You will have a slightly increased risk, but we know from other studies that that risk is very, very small. If you have a family history where many people in your family have been affected historically, then that means you almost certainly carry an ALS gene in your family, and then it is worth thinking about being tested. If you don't have a family history, but the person in your family was tested and they do carry a disease gene, that's different, then you probably should also be tested. But you could ask, why should I be tested? Well, the reason is, that the same drug, tofersin, is also in a clinical trial looking at preventing ALS from ever starting in the first place. And the reason is that when they analyzed those tofersin results from the clinical trial that's been completed, they found that probably it looks like the earlier you give the drug, the more effective it is. And so obviously the earliest you could give it is before symptoms even start. So the way that trial works is that people are giving blood tests at a regular interval, and as soon as the neurofilament level rises, then they're given tofersin. And we'll see if that actually prevents ALS from ever happening, which would be a, a wonderful outcome. But it also means that that could be offered to people with other genetic variations once there's an effective therapy for those. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was thinking on that, especially on, on the SOD1 gene, because of, of this... Uh, uh, preventive clinical trials that are, that are happening right now. It, it looks like it it makes uh, it makes some sense now to at least test for SOD one, uh, but but it's still a difficult a difficult decision to make for for family members. It's a very difficult decision, and it's extremely important that people don't just go out and buy a genetic test. You must have proper genetic counselling and understand the benefits, the disadvantages what it means to get a positive test, what it means to get a negative test, and what it means to get an uncertain test, because quite a lot of people will have what's called a variant of uncertain significance, where we don't know if it's important or not, and what does that mean, because that's quite an uncertain kind of outcome. So it's very important to have proper genetic counselling where all of these things can be discussed, and the impact on things like life insurance and health insurance and that kind of thing. So it's important. Now, one of the things that is being done at the moment, in fact, recall I came off to join this one, is from a group called Sano Genetics, 
um, which have a project called Light the Way. And that will be launching very shortly in the UK. But the idea is that within the year, it will also launch in the US. And that will have an English speaking and a Spanish speaking component. But it's a pathway where people can seek genetic information de dependent on their status. So if there's someone who's just interested or if they have a family member who's affected or if they're a gene carrier or if they're known to have ALS and they're a gene carrier or if they're known to have ALS and they don't know if they're a gene carrier. So you can go through all of those different routes and you'll be presented with information that teaches you about ALS, about the ALS genetics, and to some extent offers genetic counselling and then will give you access to proper genetic counselling if you want it. So that's a really important initiative. Okay, good. Uh, I guess uh, that's all for now. Um, so it was uh, it was really good to see you again. And uh, thank you so much again. I know you 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 you, you must be quite busy. So thanks for taking some time of your very busy schedule. It's not the first time you you do this. Uh, you you have done other presentations for us. You have visited our country too as well. Uh, for those who, who who don't remember, Dr. Amar Al Chalabi has been in Argentina in 2018, and he 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 gave some some very 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 good presentations. He not only in Buenos Aires but also in Rosario and Mar del Plata to other cities in, in, in the countryside of, of our country. So thanks again for that, Amar. Thanks for keep working on ALS and keep pushing things forward. And I guess uh, I, I might be seeing you in Basel, Switzerland, probably. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much for the invitation. And also thank you for your invitation back in 2018. I really enjoyed seeing Argentina. It's a very beautiful country. Of course. Of course. Okay. Thank you so much, Amar, and have a have a great day. And we we will stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much.